Comrades and friends, it's my pleasure to say good evening, good afternoon and good morning to all of you listening in from around the world. This evening's lecture is a third in the second series of online lectures presented by the International Committee of the Fourth International and the World Socialist website, marking the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution, the first time in world history that the working class overthrew the existing order and began to reorganise society on non-capitalist foundations. My name is Julie Highland. I am the Assistant National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in Britain, and I will be the moderator this evening. Before I introduce our speaker, for those listening in for the first time, I should explain that the first five lectures in this series were held in spring, and these have been published in a volume, Why Study the Russian Revolution, the February Revolution and the Development of Bolshevik Strategy. Details of this volume are available on the screen in front of you, and I would urge all listeners to purchase copies using the button at the bottom of the page. So far in this autumn's lecture series, which began earlier this month, we have heard presentations on Lenin's state and revolution and on the growth of the influence of the Bolshevik party, particularly in the factory committees, in the aftermath of Kornilov's defeated coup. The series will conclude on November the 11th, please note the change in date, with a lecture by David North, chairperson of the International Editorial Board of the WSWS on the place of the October Revolution in world history and contemporary politics. Again, I would urge listeners to register for this lecture using the appropriate button on this page. Our lecturer this evening is Chris Marsden, the National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in Britain and a leading member of the International Committee since 1985. The title of his lecture is Lessons of October, the Political Crisis Within the Bolshevik Party on the Eve of the Seizure of Power. After the lecture, there will be time for a question and answer session. I want to encourage the broadest possible participation and invite those listening live to comment. You can do this by submitting your comments in the discus box below the YouTube feed or by sending an email to sep at socialistequality.com. As David North explained in the opening lecture to the Spring Series, and I quote, the course of the events between February-March and October-November 1917 is not merely of historical interest. The experience of those crucial months provides an invaluable and enduring insight into strategic and tactical problems that the working class will encounter. As Trotsky wrote in 1924, but for the study of the laws and methods of proletarian revolution, there is, up to the present time, no more important and profounder source than our October experience. The approach outlined by North is critical. We study the Russian Revolution in order to prepare for our own October, or more precisely, to carry through to a successful conclusion the World Socialist Revolution that was begun by the Bolsheviks in Russia in 1917. As comrades following the excellent chronology series on the WSWS will know, this week, 100 years ago in the Western calendar, two Central Committee meetings of the Bolshevik Party took place at which the decision was taken to mount an insurrection and to set a date and prepare the forces necessary to carry this through. These meetings marked a critical stage in the struggle waged by Lenin with the support of Trotsky to orient the Bolshevik party towards the seizure of power. The controversy over this orientation within the Bolshevik leadership is the subject of tonight's lecture. I'd like to welcome Comrade Chris Marsden. Thank you for that introduction, Julie. Before I begin, uh, I would like to make clear that I'll be using the old style calendar because many of the polemics and discussions that are fo featured in this lecture use that calendar. And as the lecture, lecture's title makes clear, the Bolsheviks had to make a revolution 
before they could change the date. Now for the first lecture in this series, Comrade David North chose as his title, Why Study the Russian Revolution? In a list of 10 points answering this question, North replied, in reason 9, The Bolsheviks provided the working class with an example of what a genuine revolutionary party is and the irreplaceable role of such a party in securing the victory of the Socialist Revolution. A careful study of the revolutionary process in 1917 leaves no doubt that the presence of the Bolshevik Party, with Lenin and Trotsky in its leadership, was decisive in securing the victory of the Socialist Revolution. Examining the crisis that erupted in the Bolshevik Party on the eve of the October insurrection puts the vital question of the irreplaceable role of the Revolutionary Party under the microscope and enables us to more fully understand the task faced by our party and its cadre today. Now since returning to Russia in April, the essential work of Lenin had been to oppose every attempt to subordinate the Bolshevik party to acting as the left wing of a national democratic revolution, with the role of pressurising the bourgeoisie to ensure its completion. This was the explicit standpoint of the Mensheviks, and Social Revolutionary Party, the SRs, and it continued to be the conception animating the right wing of the Bolsheviks, led by Zinoviev and Kamenev, in a more, and in a more concealed and vacillating form by Stalin, long after the discussions on Lenin's April thesis. Lenin was for an irreconcilable struggle against any support for Russia's continued participation in the imperialist war, the capture of the Soviet majority, the overthrow of the provisional government, the seizure of power by the Soviets and the carrying through of a socialist revolution in Russia as part of a European and world socialist revolution. In September and October he had to convince his party's leadership that the time was ripe for the seizure of power. Now in his lecture Comrade Barry noted how Lenin had urged the party to abandon the slogan all power to the Soviets in favour of an explicit insistence that the party place itself at the head of an insurrection carried out in its own name and under its authority. He did so in response to the role played by the social revolutionaries and the Menshevik dominated Soviets in July in mobilising the soldiers to crush both the uprising and the Bolsheviks. He suggested that factory committees might now provide the necessary organisations for a struggle for power. However, the experience of July had convinced forces enjoying significant influence in the party's central leadership that such a course would be sheer adventurism. Throughout September, the right wing either carried through or urged initiatives that they hoped would secure the position of the Bolsheviks as the extreme left of a consolidated bourgeois democratic revolution, supporting participation by turns in the Stockholm Peace Conference Kerensky's Democratic Conference and the pre-Parliament it gave birth to. As Trotsky commented in Lessons of October, the road to Stockholm was in effect the road to the Second International, just as taking part in the pre-Parliament was the road to the Bourgeois Republic. The task of the Mensheviks and the SRs consisted in entangling the Bolsheviks in Soviet legality and afterwards painlessly transforming the latter into bourgeois parliamentary legality. The rights were ready to welcome this. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviks were already in the majority in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. Our influence in the army grew not from day to day, but from hour to hour. It was no longer a question of prognosis or perspective. It was literally a question of how we were to act the next day. Now, in his lecture, Comrade Tom Carter explained that there was growing support for the Bolsheviks in the factory committees in the aftermath of Kornilov's attempted coup and the decisive role played by Bolshevik workers in opposing it. This also found reflection in the Soviets, where the uprising forced the conciliationist-led Soviets to defend themselves, and in the aftermath led to the Bolsheviks becoming the dominant force in the Soviets themselves. Lenin repeatedly urged that the party assume direct responsibility for the insurrection. He wrote in a letter to the Central Committee on September the 14th, 
The Bolsheviks, having obtained a majority in the Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies of both capitals, that is Petersburg and Moscow, can and must take state power into their own hands. Trotsky was fully in support of the Bolshevik-led insurrection advocated by Lenin, but he favoured carrying out the revolution in the name of the Soviets. With the Bolshevik position strengthening by the day, he argued that the slogan, all power to the Soviets, must be maintained. His aim was to provide a transfer of power with the imprimatur of the widely recognised democratic organs of the workers, peasants and soldiers to maximise support amongst those who would be reluctant to support the Bolsheviks. Lenin relentlessly applied pressure on the Bolshevik party leadership to carry out the overthrow of the provisional government. Trotsky cites passages from Lenin's writings in Lessons of October. The tendency opposed to an immediate insurrection must be overcome. Delay is criminal. To wait for the Congress of Soviets will be a childish game of formalities, a disgraceful game of formalities and a betrayal of the revolution. The revolutionaries who delay risk losing everything. Now Lenin's deeds matched his words. Fearing that the procrastination of the party leadership would prove cat catastrophic and cede victory to the counter-revolution, he sought to galvanise the rank-and-file membership to both pressure the party leaders and create facts on the ground. He wrote to one of his closest confidants, Ivor Smilger, on September the 27th to discuss preparations for the uprising among the troops in Finland and the Baltic Fleet. Two days later, in a letter to the Central Committee, which he took the precaution of sending to the Moscow and Petrograd committees of the party, he made the extraordinary declaration, I am compelled to tender my resignation from the Central Committee, which I hereby do, reserving for myself freedom to campaign among the rank and file and at the party congress. For it is my profound conviction that if we wait for the Congress of Soviets and let the present moment pass, we shall ruin the revolution. Now what determined Lenin's sense of urgency so that a delay for a single day, let alone for weeks, could not be tolerated? The situation in Russia he considered ripe for revolution. In July, when an uprising in St. Peters Petersburg may have been supported in Moscow, but not the rest of the country, Lenin urged restraint. Now a peasant insurrection against the rich landowners was growing, creating the necessary conditions for the proletariat to win the backing of the agrarian masses. Moreover, Lenin's political concern was not only with the Russian situation, but the fate of the world proletariat. He based his revolutionary perspective on international and not merely Russian conditions. He made clear that he considered delay to be a potentially fatal blow to the European revolution he foresaw emerging in response to the horrors of war. In letters dated October the 8th for the upcoming Congress of Northern Soviets on October the 10th, Lenin states, Our revolution is passing through a highly critical period. This crisis coincides with the Great Crisis, the growth of the World Socialist Revolution and the struggle waged against it by world imperialism. A gigantic task is being presented to the responsible leaders of our party, and failure to perform it will involve the danger of a complete collapse of the internationalist proletarian movement. The situation is such that, in truth, delay would be fatal. Pointing to the general strike in Turin, Italy, and strikes by Czech workers, he states of the mutiny aboard the battleship Prince Regent Leopold and other ships by hundreds of sailors demanding an end to the war that, and I quote, a more impressive sign of the growth of revolution than a revolt among the troops cannot be imagined. Yes, we should be real traitors to the international if, at such a moment and under such favourable conditions, we respond to this call from the German revolutionaries with mere resolutions. Now, the long struggle to reorient the party culminated in a central committee meeting on October the 10th. Lenin attended, arriving disguised. Thanks to the authority he wielded, he did not need to resign. His motion was passed 
by 10 votes to 2. Though no date was set for an uprising, the resolution was imbued with all the urgency Lenin could impart and details the political basis on which the decision had been taken. It begins with the international position of the Russian Revolution, listing the revolt of the German Navy as an extreme manifestation of the growth throughout Europe of the World Socialist Revolution. The intention of the imperialists to strangle the revolution in Russia. It then examines the situation in Russia itself, listing the decision of the Russian bourgeoisie and of the provisional government to surrender Petrograd to the Germans and to make plans for a second military coup the securing of a Bolshevik majority in the Soviets and the Peasant Revolt. The resolution concludes, Considering therefore that an armed uprising is inevitable and the time for it is fully ripe, the Central Committee instructs all party organisations to be guided accordingly and to discuss and decide all practical questions. The Congress of Soviets of the Northern Region the withdrawal of troops from Petrograd, the action of our people in Moscow and Minsk, etc., from this point of view. Now this was a truly historic event. For the first time ever, a party representing the working class had not only set itself the general aim of replacing capitalism with socialism, but had committed itself to making a revolution. <coughs> Trotsky notes, however, even now there was concern and intense discussion as to when the revolution should be made and under what authority. He continued to argue that a date for insurrection should be set a few days before the planned convening of the Second Congress of Soviets, initially set for October the 20th, so that it could then be sanctioned by that body. And his position won out because it was correct. Trotsky proved to the master strategist of the insurrection, so that no less than Joseph Stalin himself wrote on the first anniversary of October, all practical work in connection with the organisation of the uprising was done under the immediate direction of Comrade Trotsky, the President of the Petrograd Soviet. It can be stated with certainty that the party is indebted primarily and principally to Comrade Trotsky for the rapid going over the garrison to the side of the Soviet and the efficient manner in which the work of the Military Revolutionary Committee was organised. Now Trotsky explains in Lessons of October that Lenin need not have feared that doing so was an impermissible delay. To prepare the insurrection under this cover, that is the cover of the Congress of Soviets, was politically of inestimable advantage to the Bolsheviks. And moreover, Trotsky was not delaying, he was preparing. This is what Trotsky writes. From the moment when we, as the Petrograd Soviet, invalidated Kerensky's order transferring two-thirds of the garrison to the front, we had actually entered a state of armed insurrection. Lenin, who was not in Petrograd, could not appraise the full significance of this fact. Yet the outcome of the insurrection of October the 25th was at least three quarters settled, if not more. The moment that we opposed the transfer of the Petrograd gar garrison created the Military Revolutionary Committee on October the 16th, appointed our own commissars in all army divisions and institutions, and thereby completely isolated not only the general staff of the Petrograd zone, but also the government. In the next days, the threat to the insurrection's success Lenin feared from within the party was to take the form of an open revolt. Zinoviev and Kamenev remained resolutely against the insurrection as expressed in their October the 10th vote. Lenin requested another meeting of the Central Committee, which assembled on October the 16th. At that meeting, the October 10th resolution was endorsed by a majority of 20 votes to two this time with four abstaining. Kamenev responded by resigning from the Central Committee. After their demand to express dissent in the Bolshevik press was denied, Kamenev, backed by Zinoviev, broke ranks 
and went to Maxim Gorky's Novaya Zin. In its pages, on October the 18th, he publicly attacked plans for an insurrection that, for obvious reasons, had not been made public. He wrote, We are most deeply convinced that to proclaim an armed uprising right now means to gamble not only the fate of our party, but the fate of the Russian and international revolution as well. Against insurrection, Kamenev proposed patiently working to make it impossible for the bourgeoisie, quote, to disrupt the Constituent Assembly by using the Bolsheviks' influence in the Soviets, the army and among the workers. Any attempt to disrupt the Constituent Assembly now, he said, would again push the petty bourgeois parties towards us. With the correct tactics, we can win a third or even more of the seats in the Constituent Assembly. The situation was not ripe. The workers and soldiers were for the Bolsheviks, but only due to pacifist, anti-war sentiment. He continued, If we now take power alone and confront, as a result of the whole world situation, the necessity of waging revolutionary war, the mass of the soldiers will pour away from us. And here we approach the second assertion, that the international proletariat is supposedly now already with us in the majority. This, unfortunately, is not yet so. <clears throat> now, were these fears without foundation? Of course not. The Bolsheviks confronted immense odds, and the situation they faced, even following the seizure of power, was one of an eruption of civil war and imperialist intervention. But Kamenev and Zinoviev saw, uh, saw only disaster ahead due to the apparent strength of reaction. In contrast, Lenin saw a situation pregnant with revolutionary opportunities, with the possibility of victory. Like that other great revolutionary, Abraham Lincoln, he had concluded, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. Now there's a key passage in Lessons of October dealing with the political psychology of Zinoviev and Kamenev, which stands as a sober warning to this day. Trotsky notes how their letter warns that the greatest danger will be to overestimate the strength of the revolutionary forces and underestimate the forces of reaction. This is what they wrote. The forces of the opponent are greater than they appear. Petrograd is decisive, and in Petrograd the enemies of the proletarian party have accumulated substantial forces. 5,000 military cadets excellently armed, organised, anxious because of their class position and able to fight. Also the staff, shock troops, Cossacks, a substantial part of the garrison and very considerable artillery which has taken up a position in fan-like formation around Petrograd. Now Trotsky explains how this same standpoint led to the calling off of an insurrection by the Communist Party of Germany in 1923, of how a party leadership, overwhelmed by the apparent strength of the counter-revolution, completely underestimated what he described as the effective forces of the German Revolution, that is, the immensely powerful German proletariat. He then makes these points. Our Russian example is of great significance in this connection. Two weeks prior to our bloodless victory in Petrograd, and we could have gained it even two weeks earlier, experienced party politicians saw arrayed against us the military cadets, anxious and able to fight, the shock troops, the Cossacks, a substantial part of the garrison, the artillery in fan-like formation, and the troops arriving from the front. But in reality, all of this came to nothing. In round figures, zero. Here is the lesson which must be burnt into the consciousness of every revolutionist. Zinoviev and Kamenev completely misread not only the balance of social forces arraigned in the revolutionary contest that was now posed, they also made a false estimation of the petty bourgeois parties. Lenin had rooted the development of opportunism and the eruption of social chauvinism in 1914 
within the Second International in the social relations made possible by imperialism. The ability of the ruling class to buy the loyalty of privileged petty bourgeois strata, including the labour aristocracy, which functioned as the principal social base of the parties of the Second International. Zinoviev and Kamenev calculated that the Mensheviks et al. will be driven towards the Bolsheviks and will help take forward the struggle to pressure the bourgeoisie to implement democratic measures. In contrast from his analysis, Lenin concluded that the self-same social democrats were, quote, the real agents of the bourgeoisie in the working class movement, the labour lieutenants of the capitalist class. In the civil war between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, they inevitably, and in no small numbers, take the side of the bourgeoisie, the Versailles against the communards. <coughs> Lenin was of course furious at the disloyalty of Zinoviev and Kamenev, denouncing them as strike breakers and blacklegs for their attack in a paper which on this very question is hand in glove with the bourgeoisie against the workers party. Rejecting claims that the masses were not with the Bolsheviks, he declared, The most outstanding fact in the present situation is the revolt of the peasantry. Here is an objective passing over of the people to the side of the Bolsheviks, shown not by words but by deeds. Delaying the uprising means death. This is what we have to answer to those having the sad courage to look at the growing economic ruin, at the approaching famine and still dissuade the workers from the uprising. Now on the day Kamenev's attack was published the delegates of the Petrograd military units met. They were split down the middle on stage in an insurrection against the provisional government. Confirming Trotsky's position moreover they would only support it if it was conducted on behalf of the Soviets. Fortuitously the non-Bolshevik parties in the Soviets took fright at the Bolsheviks' growing influence and rescheduled the Congress of Soviets for October the 25th, the better to mobilise their own supporters. Instead, this extra five days gave the Bolsheviks and Trotsky, who was in overall charge, the necessary time to prepare and carry through the insurrection. Thanks to the intense political and organisational preparations involved, this took place without serious loss of life. The Soviet headquarters at the Smolny had been transformed into a fortress guarded by machine guns and was under the control of the Bolsheviks. On the morning of October the 24th the government closed down the central organ of the Bolshevik party and the paper of the Petrograd Soviet and placed seals on the printing works. A woman printer responded by asking Trotsky couldn't we break the seals? He replied, break them, and sent the Litovsky Regiment and the 6th Sapper Reserve Battalion to make sure that this was done. The telephone exchange was also liberated by a detachment of sailors from the grip of military students who were intent on barring all Soviet communications. That night, members of the Military Revolutionary Committee were dispatched to all districts of the city. The government had ordered the cruiser Aurora to steam out of the Neva, but the Bolshevik sailors were loyal to the Military Revolutionary Committee and stayed put. Trotsky heard reports of a, det of a detachment of artillery, a battalion of shock troops and student officers from the Peterhof Military School, officers and the, women, and the women's battalion being mobilised by Kerensky and the provisional government. He ordered military defences to be placed on all approaches to the city. As things turned out, the streets in fact belonged to the Bolsheviks, and few responded to Kerensky's orders except some of the military students. Armed Bolshevik-led detachments took control of one institution after another and all the most important points in St. Petersburg. The next morning, October the 25th, the government is still in session at the Winter Palace, but the weekly guarded palace has been surrounded. At one o'clock, Trotsky makes a public statement. He states, On behalf of the Military Revolutionary Committee, I declare that the provisional government is no longer existent. Some ministers have been arrested. 
others will be arrested in the course of a few days or hours. The Winter Palace has not yet been taken, but its fate will be decided during the next few minutes. The palace is taken without a fight. As Trotsky states, thanks to the preparatory work of the Military Revolutionary Committee, quote, the insurrection of October the 25th was only supplementary in character. This is precisely why it was painless. Now perhaps the best description of what had been achieved, and certainly the most famous, was when Trotsky replied to the Menshevik leader, Fyodor Dan, at that evening's session of the Congress of Soviets. In answer to Dan's railing against conspirators and insistence that the Bolsheviks form a coalition with the social, social revolutionists and the Mensheviks, Trotsky replied, What has taken place is an uprising, not a conspiracy. An uprising of the masses of the people needs no justification. We have been strengthening the revolutionary energy of the workers and soldiers. We have been forging, openly, the will of the masses for an uprising. Our uprising has won, and now we are being asked to give up our victory, to come to an agreement with whom? You are wretched, disunited individuals. You are bankrupts. Your party's over. Go to the place where you belong from now on, the dustbin of history. Now, even after the seizure of power, on November the 4th, four CC members, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Rykov and Nogin, resigned from both the CC and the Council of People's Commissars, along with two others. They demanded the formation of a coalition government composed of all Soviet parties in a new constituent assembly, while denouncing the ruinous policy pursued by Lenin and Trotsky. Now, those hearing this lecture can imagine, therefore, how Trotsky's opponents responded to his raising these historical issues in his Lessons of October, when it was published in October 1924. His essay was written as the introduction to a two-volume collection of Trotsky's writings on year one of the Russian Revolution titled 1917. This was part of a project to publish his collected works. Its 60 plus pages examine the essential role played by the vanguard Marxist party in the imperialist epoch of wars and social revolution. It is one of the most important and illuminating pamphlets ever written. Proceeding from a concrete depiction of the struggle waged by the Bolshevik party to mobilise the working class for the seizure of power, it details the most fundamental political requirements for waging a successful revolutionary struggle against capitalism. <coughs> Lessons of October was published in the aftermath of the abortive revolutionary events in Bulgaria and more importantly in Germany the previous year in which the policies pursued by the Comintern and its affiliated parties proved disastrous. In Bulgaria a June 9 coup d'etat deposed the government of the Bulgarian Agrarian National Union headed by the peasant leader Alexander Stambuliski and put Alexander Sankov, the pre-war leader of Bulgarian fascism in power. The coup was opposed by activists of the Agrarian National Union and individual communist volunteers in what was known as the June Uprising, but this was crushed due to the abstentionism of the Bulgarian Communist Party, which declared the coup to be a struggle for power between the urban and rural bourgeoisie. The Comintern belatedly, in August, urged the Bulgarian Communist Party to stage an uprising just one month later. No time was given to mobilise the workers and agrarian masses, and the military government began a programme of mass arrests of Communist Party members when the plan became known. The Communist Party nevertheless carried out the Comintern's instructions, staging an uprising on September the 23rd that was put down with great ruthlessness. Trotsky wrote of this disaster All sympathies shifted leftward and we were transferred and were transferred to the Communist Party. The enemy's armed forces were infinitesimal and yet we were beaten. What was lacking was a clear, distinct plan of action and a decisive blow and at appointed moment at an appointed place. 
this is essentially a military revolutionary task. For this, the enemy has to be thrown on his back. The initiative has to be taken from him. Power has to be wrested from him. Of greater import still was Germany. Revolution in Germany was the key to the success of the European and World Revolution and with it the survival of the Soviet Union. The most economically developed bourgeois power in Europe was constrained by the terms of the Versailles Treaty to make reparations to the victorious Allied powers of World War I. In that year the German imperialists refused to continue doing so, to which France responded in January by occupying the Ruhr. Germany's rulers responded by printing massive amounts of money to pay for a policy of resistance which led to hyperinflation and spurred on an eruption of class tensions. With the French occupation of the Ruhr a far-reaching economic and political crisis ensued. This led to a dramatic growth of the Communist Party which had the support of millions of workers. The issue of socialist revolution was posed point blank. However, instead of pursuing a revolutionary policy, the KPD formed an alliance with left Social Democrats in Saxony. And when the party leadership finally set the date for an insurrection, its leader, Heinrich Brandler, called off the uprising because it did not have the support of the left Social Democrats. The decision was taken at a Congress of Factory Councils in Chemnitz, Saxony on October the 21st. This Congress was supposed to call a general strike to give the signal for an insurrection across the country. A majority of the delegates would have supported the call for a general strike, as Brandler admitted in a private letter to Clara Zetkin. But, he explained, during the Chemnitz conference, I realised that we could under no circumstances enter the decisive struggle once we had not been able to convince the left SPD to sign the decision for a general strike. Against massive resistance, I altered course and prevented us, the Communists, from entering the struggle on our own. As is known, the decision to cancel the revolution didn't reach Hamburg in time. An insurrection there was organised, but remaining isolated, it was defeated bloodily within three days. The response of the Comintern was to blame the entire affair on Brandler. But ultimate political responsibility for this disaster lay with the leadership of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the leadership of the Comintern. In the front rank, the head of the Comintern, Zinoviev, Kamenev and Stalin, who were then in a factional struggle against Trotsky. Trotsky had agitated for the German party to lead a planned insurrection in Germany as the Bolsheviks had done in October 1917 and in weeks, not months. In a speech to the Red Army and Red Navy on October the 21st, the very day Brandler called off the planned insurrection, Trotsky declared, In order to ensure military success for a revolution, one needs to want to achieve this success at any price and actively to strive for it, breaking down all the obstacles in one's path. In contrast, Stalin had urged restraint stressing that the workers still had confidence in the Social Democrats and even asserting that, quote, for us it would be an advantage if the fascists strike first. Trotsky had been in alliance with the by now desperately ill Lenin since 1922 against Stalin's Russian nationalist politics. It was a conflict that ended with Lenin urging Stalin's removal as General Secretary. Trotsky had formed the left opposition in 1923. The publication of Lessons of October was politically devastating for his opponents, but it was not simply a polemical retort. Trotsky's concern was with the fate of the World Socialist Revolution and nothing less. In the first chapter, we must study the Russian Revolution, Trotsky insists the following. For the study of the laws and methods of proletarian revolution, there is up to the present time no more important and profounder source than our October experience. Leaders of European Communist parties who fail to assimilate the history of October by means of a critical and closely detailed study 
would resemble a commander-in-chief preparing new wars under modern conditions who fails to study the strategic, tactical and technical experience of the last imperialist war. Such a commander-in-chief would inevitably doom his armies to defeat in the future. Trotsky explained how we witnessed in Germany a classic demonstration of how it is possible to miss a perfectly exceptional revolutionary situation of world historic importance. He opposed the errors of the Comintern by contrasting them with the approach taken by the Bolshevik party under Lenin in 1917. And in so doing, he exposed the rea reality behind the claims of his opponents that the Bolshevik party had acted throughout 1917 as a monolithic entity in which the, only the upstart and interloper Trotsky was an alien tendency. Trotsky raised the uncomfortable truth that Lenin had fought for the October insurrection in the face of determined and open opposition from Zinoviev and Kamenev and a constantly vacillating position on the part of Stalin. Moreover, he placed central emphasis on the fact that this opposition to the October insurrection was rooted in hostility to Lenin's April thesis. Lenin's agreement with Trotsky's appraisal of the socialist character of the coming revolution began months of inner party struggle against the future triumvirate, beginning with their support for the, the dem bourgeois provisional government and political adaptation to defensive justifications for continuing the war. Even so, Trotsky made clear in his introduction, quote, The disagreements of 1917 were indeed very profound, and they were not by any means accidental. But nothing could be more paltry than an attempt to turn them now, after a lapse of several years, into weapons of attack against those who were at that time mistaken. Zinoviev, Kamenev and Stalin felt no such compunction. In a marker for the future, they railed against Trotskyism. They accused Trotsky of minimising the role of Lenin, of revising Leninism, and having published the volume 1917 behind the backs of the Central Committee. Zinoviev went so far as to demand his expulsion from the party, so that Trotsky felt compelled to resign as the People's Commissar of Army and Fleet Affairs and Chairman of the Revolutionary Military Council. In these events, the pattern was set in which Trotsky's every effort to politically re reorient the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Communist International met with ferocious and entirely unprincipled opposition. Now, the necessarily brief historical narrative I've provided, I hope, helps to better understand the political basis of Trotsky's universal conclusions from the events of October 1917. The most fundamental passages from Lessons of October repeatedly focus on the essential role of the party in the Socialist Revolution. Trotsky insists, without a party, apart from a party, over the heads of a party, or with a substitute for a party, the proletarian revolution cannot conquer. That is the principal lesson of the past decade. Again, he writes in the introduction, Events have proved that without a party capable of directing the proletarian revolution, the revolution itself is rendered impossible. The proletariat cannot seize power by a spontaneous uprising. One propertied class is able to seize the power that has been wrested from another propertied class because it is able to base itself upon its riches, its cultural level and its innumerable connections with the old state apparatus. But there is nothing else that can serve the proletariat as a substitute for its own party. Trotsky then turns his attention to the significance of the inner party struggle as it develops in the course of preparing a revolution. He rejects all purely subjective explanations of such disputes, insisting that the struggle between political tendencies and fractions articulate opposed social interests, either of classes or fractions of classes. In the cauldron of revolution, when class conflicts have reached a peak intensity and bear down on the party and its cadre, factional, factional disputes were inevitable. 
he wrote, The fundamental instrument of proletarian revolution is the party. On the basis of our experience, even taking only one year from February 1917 to February 1918, and on the basis of the supplementary experience of Finland, Hungary, Italy, Bulgaria and Germany, we can posit as almost an unalterable law that a party crisis is inevitable in the transition from preparatory revolutionary activity to the immediate struggle for power. Explaining why this is so, he continues. Every period in the development of the party has special features of its own and calls for specific habits and methods of work. A tactical turn implies a greater or lesser break in these habits and methods. Herein lies the direct and most immediate route of internal party frictions and crises. Hence the danger arises that if the turn is too abrupt or too sudden, and if in the preceding period too many elements of inertia and conservatism have accumulated in the leading organs of the party, then the party will prove itself unable to fulfil its leadership at that supreme and critical moment for which it has been preparing itself in the course of years or decades. The party is ravaged by a crisis and the movement passes the party by and heads towards defeat. Summing up these dangers, he warns, to put the case more plainly, the party that does not keep step with the historical task of its own class becomes or runs the risk of becoming the indirect tool of other classes. No turn is more fundamental than the preparation to seize power. Trotsky defines this as a strategic rather than tactical turn, making the essential point that the necessity for such a distinction is itself the political product of the imperialist epoch of wars and revolutions. Prior to the First World War, the task of making an insurrection, of taking power, never presented itself to the parties of the Second International other than for the Russian Social Democrats in 1905. The 1905 revolution gave the Russian Marxists a major advantage in that it prompted an intense discussion on revolutionary strategy. Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, insisting that the solution of the democratic and national tasks in countries like Russia with a belated capitalist development was only possible through the working class coming to power in a socialist revolution, was its supreme product. In contrast, the prevailing intellectual atmosphere in the Second International continued to be dominated by the application of parliamentary tactics, trade union tactics, municipal tactics, cooperative tactics, etc. Karl Kautsky summarises this outlook in an article published in Neue Zeit in December 1893. This is from that article. Kautsky says, The Socialist Party is a revolutionary party, but not a revolution-making party. We know that our goal can be attained only through a revolution. We also know that it is just as little in our power to create this revolution as it is in the power of our opponents to prevent it. It is not part of our work to instigate a revolution or to prepare the way for it. The quote finishes with the statement, Since we know nothing concerning the decisive battles of the social war, we are manifestly unable to say whether they will be bloody or not, whether physical force will play a decisive part or whether they will be fought exclusively by means of economic, legislative and moral pressure. Now Kautsky himself cites this passage in The Road to Power, which was written as his response to the 1905 revolution. In it he insists that, despite events in undemocratic Russia, we are, quote, quite safe in saying that the revolutionary battles of the proletariat will be largely waged by applying, quote, economic, legislative and moral pressure and, quote, will be less frequently fought out by military methods due, he says, to the colossal superiority of the present standing of the weapons of the present standing armies 
which make any resistance of the latter practically doomed to failure from the beginning. Praising the working class for its self-control and resistance to any adventurous policy, he stresses that the central task of the socialist leadership was to avoid the provocations of the bourgeoisie and, quote, seek by every means in their power to postpone any such insane uprising, even if it is recognised as inevitable, to a time when the proletariat shall be so powerful that the sacrifice it costs shall be as small as possible. Now all of this begs the question, what happens when the time of wisdom in avoiding provocations, of combating ultra-left adventurism and steadily strengthening the position of the proletariat gives way to the hour in which the insurrection must be made. The Bolsheviks, whose history was one of constant struggle against opportunism, were the most revolutionary party the world had yet seen. As Trotsky explains, the traditions of the heroic struggle against the Tsarist monarchy, the habituation to revolutionary self-sacrifice bound up with the conditions of underground activity, the broad theoretical study and assimilation of the revolutionary experiences of humanity, the struggle against Menshevism, against the Narodniks and against conciliationism, the supreme experience of the 1905 revolution, the theoretical study and assimilation of this experience through the years of counter-revolution, the examination of the problems of the international labour movement in the light of the revolutionary lessons of 1905. These were the things which in their totality gave our party an exceptional revolutionary temper, supreme theoretical penetration and unparalleled revolutionary sweep. However, even in this party, opposition to insurrection was strong. It gave rise to conflict between a proletarian tendency striving towards world revolution and a petty bourgeois tendency whose politics led to the subordination of the proletariat to the bourgeois order. Such inner party conflicts were not accidental but inevitable both then and in subsequent revolutionary situations. Trotsky writes, If by Bolshevism, and we are stressing here its essential aspect, we understand such training, tempering, and organisation of the proletarian vanguard as enables the latter to seize power arms in hand. And if by social democracy we are, are to understand the acceptance of reformist oppositional activity within the framework of bourgeois society and an ad adaptation to its legality, i.e. the actual training of the masses to become imbue, imbued with the inviability of the bourgeois state, then indeed it is absolutely clear that even within the Communist Party itself, which does not emerge full-fledged from the crucible of history, the struggle between social democratic tendencies and Bolshevism is bound to reveal itself in its most clear, open and uncamouflaged form during the immediate revolutionary period when the question of power is posed point-blank. The final issue I want to stress is how Trotsky appraised the role of Lenin in the revolution. Yes, he disagreed with Lenin over the tactical efficacy of waging the insurrectionary struggle under the banner of the party or under the banner of the Soviets. But no one was more supremely aware of the vital historical role Lenin played in driving forward the party leadership on the path of insurrection. He asked rhetorically, is it really true that such a historic event can hinge upon an interval of 24 hours? Yes, it can. Had Lenin not sounded the alarm, had there not been all this pressure and criticism on his part, had it not been for his intense and passionate revolutionary mistrust, the party would probably have failed to align its front at the decisive moment, for the opposition among the party leaders was very strong and the staff plays a major role in all wars, including civil wars. Summing up the political task facing the Communist International, he concludes with a passage, both concise and at the same time profound. He asks, What is the Bolshevization of the Communist parties? It is giving them such a training, 
and effecting such a selection of the leading staff as would prevent them from drifting when the hour for their October strikes. That is the whole of Hegel and the wisdom of books and the meaning of all philosophy. A key passage from Trotsky's biography of Stalin addresses the relationship between a leader of genius like Lenin and the Revolutionary Party. Superficially, there appears to be a contradiction between the stress placed on the role of Lenin as a leader of genius and the vital role of the Vanguard Party in the Revolution. But this is only the case if the relationship between the two is not properly understood. Trotsky asked the following, But by what miracle did Lenin manage in a few short weeks to turn the party's course into a new channel? The answer should be sought simultaneously in two directions. Lenin's personal attributes and the objective situation. Lenin was strong not only because he understood the laws of the class struggle, but also because his ear was faultlessly attuned to the stirrings of the masses in motion. He represented not so much the party machine as the vanguard of the proletariat. Lenin exerted influence not so much as an individual, but because he embodied the influence of the class on the party and of the party on its machine. He then continues by asking, Does it mean then that in the Bolshevik party Lenin was everything and all the others nothing? And he rejects such an appraisal. He says, Geniuses do not create science out of themselves. They merely accelerate the process of collective thinking. The Bolshevik party had a leader of genius. That was no accident. A revolutionist of Lenin's makeup and breadth could be the leader only of the most fearless party, capable of carrying its thoughts and actions to their logical conclusion. Without the party, Lenin would have been as helpless as Newton or Darwin without collective scientific work. Now Lenin remarked in the heat of revolutionary events that once, that once Trotsky had understood that there could be no organisational unity with the Mensheviks, there had been no better Bolshevik. Lessons of October must be understood as the intellectual product of Trotsky's assimilation of the essence of Bolshevism. In 1982, David North wrote four essays under the collective title Leon Trotsky and the Development of Marxism to mark the fifth anniversary of the assassination of Tom Henehan. In them, North writes the following. Based on the concrete historical experience of the working class in Russia and on an international scale, Trotsky elaborated the conception that the fate of the socialist revolution for a number of years and even for decades can hinge on the decisions made by the leadership of a Marxist party in the course of a few days. The concept of cadre training and of the role of the international was invested with a new historical content. The historic task of the Comintern was to train an international cadre in the leadership in its sections capable of fulfilling this task. To prepare for the revolution and to ensure its success means developing the party cadre and above all its leaders as Marxists to give, quote, such a training and effecting such a selection of the leading staff as would prevent them from drifting when the hour for their October strikes, as Trotsky wrote in Lessons of October. This is what is meant by the concept Trotsky developed of the party as a school of revolutionary strategy. Why he says that preparing for the next October is the whole of Hegel and the wisdom of books and the meaning of all philosophy, and why he insists, without a penetrating, resolute and courageous party leadership, the victory of the proletarian revolution is impossible. Today, the International Committee of the Fourth International and the World Socialist website are alone in taking seriously Trotsky's insistence on studying the lessons of the October Revolution. The October Revolution is the most seminal event in world history. For the first time ever, the working class overthrew the bourgeois order and took the first heroic step on the road to world socialist revolution. 
the terrible events that overtook the revolution, its bureaucratic degeneration under Stalin, the terrible crimes per per perpetrated, cannot be allowed to obscure this historic achievement, nor prevent the working class learning all that can be learned from it. Those who have listened to this lecture series will recognise how the issues dealt with by Trotsky, such as the struggle against war and defensism, the theory of permanent revolution and Lenin's April thesis, the July days, the preparations for October and so on, have been the essential subject matter of our own presentations. It is by such means the politi political education of the best and most far-sighted elements of the working class and youth that we are preparing the path for the socialist revolution. Trotsky wrote in the Transitional Programme, the founding document of the Fourth International, all talk to the effect that historical conditions have not, not yet ripened for socialism is the product of ignorance or conscious deception. The objective prerequisites for the proletarian revolution have not only ripened, they have begun to get somewhat rotten. Without a socialist revolution, in the next historical period at that, a catastrophe threatens the whole culture of mankind. The turn is now to the proletariat, i.e. chiefly to its revolutionary vanguard. The historical crisis of mankind is reduced to the crisis of the revolutionary leadership. Resolving this crisis means joining and building the International Committee of the Fourth International. In its ranks, the advanced workers and youth will be steeled as the revolutionary political leadership that is so urgently required as world capitalism descends into a new period of wars and of revolutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Chris, for that extremely interesting and informative lecture. I'm sure you would like to know, as indeed our listeners online would like to know, that your lecture has been followed by listeners in many different countries. Um, this includes from uh, across the United States, Canada, India, Sri Lanka, Germany, France, Spain, the UK, Bulgaria, Australia, Turkey, Japan, Zimbabwe, Costa Rica, and many other countries. I'm sure it will be clearer to all those listening just how fundamental were the issues and conflicts that arose at this time, not only for the course of the Russian Revolution itself, but for world history. And your lecture has further certainly underscored the centrality of the leadership provided by Lenin and Trotsky, a political coming together of these two great leaders, which Comrade Coogan explained in his lecture, ranks amongst the most important events in modern history. Just as an example of the feedback that we're getting on uh, this lecture, I can give as an example a comment that has been sent, greetings from Central Florida, this entire lecture series on the centenary of the Russian Revolution has been outstanding from the beginning. Huge improvements in quality and technical delivery make these lectures world-class historical lessons. The podcasts allow for convenience and review, while the transcripts have been well footnoted. Q&A has improved along the way too, which is a testament to the seriousness to the WSWS followers. It surely was a Herculean task to put these lectures and weekly write-ups together in a way that draws meaning to 2017. Let's face it, if the WSWS didn't do this, then it wouldn't have gotten done. I have learned much from these lectures, both in a historical context and in a practical modern revolutionary sense. Hats off to all those that made this series happen. Now, before beginning the question and answer section of this lecture, I would just like to make an appeal for resources. Firstly, in terms of financial contributions to the World Socialist website. I want to urge everyone listening to make the largest possible donation to the WSWS, and not only as a one-off, but as a regular contributor. If you are not already a subscriber, Please sign up this evening to make a monthly donation to the website. Your support 
is really vital. We are at a critical juncture in world history in which all the fundamental problems and issues posed at the beginning of the 20th century and which provided the objective basis for the Russian Revolution are re-emerging on an even higher level. The danger of world war, this time fought with nuclear weapons, the growth of right-wing and fascistic tendencies, the turn to authoritarian and dictatorial forms of rule by the bourgeoisie, and above all, the huge growth in social inequality and the class chasm resulting from it that makes any so-called peaceful or reformist solution to this crisis impossible. Now, of course, the most important resource needed for the revolutionary movement is CADA. The International Committee of the Fourth International alone defends and continues the revolutionary traditions and principles of the Bolshevik Party and October 1917. That is why we have taken this centenary so seriously and we've made it central to the education of a new generation of revolutionary fighters. So I would urge all those listening to take the decision, if they haven't already, to join the International Committee and fight to build sections of this revolutionary world movement in the country they are listening from. You can use the join and donate buttons on this page. I would also remind you again that the first series of five lectures has been published as volume one of Why Study the Russian Revolution, and it can be purchased from the International Committee's publishing house, Maring Books. Again, the link is available at the end of this page. And everyone should really make sure they have a copy of the truly wonderful and inspiring documentary film, Tsar to Lenin, directed by Herman Axelbank and narrated by Max Eastman. Again, this can be purchased using the link on the bottom of the page. In fact, both items, that is the first volume of Why Study the Russian Revolution and the Tsar to Lenin documentary, are available as a special sale bundle, available only for a limited time at the discounted price of $25, again available through Mehring Books. Last but by no means least, I want to draw listeners' attention to the online petition against internet censorship and, in particular, the blacklisting of the World Socialist website. As readers will know, the World Socialist website is under a concerted attack organised through Google. In April, Google implemented a new search algorithm to restrict access to socialist, anti-war, left-wing and progressive websites. Many such sites have been impacted, but none more so than the World Socialist website. Between April and July this year, the WSWS experienced a 70% reduction in readers accessing the site from Google. These moves, organised on the spurious basis of stopping fake news, are nothing less than a conspiracy to censor the internet, involving powerful corporations in alliance with the state. And this extends from Google to Facebook and YouTube. The fight back organised by the WSWS is your fight. The aim of this censorship is the suppression of the democratic rights of the working class to silence its voice and opposition to the headlong rush to war, militarism and dictatorship. In addition to the petition drive launched against this by the WSWS, the Socialist Equality Parties internationally are holding meetings to alert workers and youth to what is taking place. I ask you to sign the petition, encourage your fellow students, friends and co-workers to do the same, build the meetings and support the WSWS financially and politically. Your support is now more crucial than ever. And now I would like to turn to the question and answer session of this uh, lecture series. Uh, we have had in a number of questions, uh, both through discus and via email. Uh, I will begin with one sent in by email, uh, which is a question to Chris. What do you think of the way the October Revolution is being depicted by the world's media? And this listener remarks how awful he thinks the coverage has been. <laughs> well, I, I, I 
No, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it has been pretty dreadful. Um, obviously, we, we have uh, in uh, presentations by Tom Carter and uh, elsewhere discussed at some length the um, articles that appeared in the uh, major newspapers and theoretical journals and so on. I don't. And I don't want to. Um, raise that again. I mean, I, I was struck personally by two things which I thought were basically explain why, it, not only that it is terrible, but why it's so terrible. Um, I, I'm sure that some of our listeners will have noted the advanced publicity uh, and some articles that it's ingen generated, the fact that Russia's main TV channel one has produced a lavish, lavish six-part dramatization of the of the life of Leon Trotsky. Uh, in case anyone uh, is mistake mistakenly believes this is a good thing, it should be pointed out. I mean, it's a filthy anti-Semitic work, in which today's oligarchy around Putin just basically borrow from the playbook of the Black Hundreds. Uh, the whole narrative is that Trotsky was the real brains behind the Russian Revolution and that his aim was to drown Mother Russia in blood. Um, I was struck, uh, you know, to paraphrase uh, Comrade North, here's, here's the uh, first preemptive biopic. It's a character assassination directed against someone the producers described as the rock star of the revolution which he, uh, is explicitly designed to warn against the evils that revolution represents. Now, that's the uh, Russian oligarchy, but it's not really any different in the West. We've been discussing, uh, we've been discussing in Britain uh, the flagship program produced by the BBC as part of its uh, Russia season on the October Revolution Centenary, which was called Russia 1917 Countdown to Revolution, and it was similarly as, in its own way, just as filthy as uh, that which is being produced in uh, Russia. It had the uh, had the character of a sort of true true crime drama on a bad reality TV station, with Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin all in the dock as criminals together. Stalin, basically, because. Uh, despite the fact he played little part in the events depicted, uh, his presence enabled the, them to sort of ominously intone every revolution needs its Stalin. Um, the narrator uh, asks at one point, you know, was the revolution a triumph of people power or was it a coup? Tat that instigated a blood blood soaked totalitarianism, and you can guess basically what the verdict that was going to be delivered. Uh, the entire affair, I mean, it's permeated by a stench of anti communism. The people that, that were talking heads throughout it included the likes of Simon Sabag Montefiore, Orlan Orlando Figis, and Victor Sebastian, who queued up. Uh, one after the other to rail against uh, Stalin and Lenin, uh, sorry Trotsky and Lenin. And in fact, I mean, Lenin barely appeared on screen without scowling and calling someone, calling for someone or other to be flogged or shot. Uh, but I, I, I did, I was struck. I mean, just one thing I, I did, I thought was politically quite important in this uh, horrible mess, and that was uh, the way that Figis. Uh, deals with one ev one event during the revolution. He says, uh, you know, he describes the fact that one night on October the 24th, the night of the insurrection, Lenin is walking towards the Smolny in heavy disguise and he comes across a uh, group of soldiers come police officers who don't recognise him and let him through. And, and I mean, Figgis is just incensed by this. He says, you can see, he's, he's you know, whole bodies in this one and he and he says uh, that he says that this was uh, the real turning point of the 20th century and uh, the basic argument he puts forward is that had these police officers not been stupid 
had they arrested Lenin, then there would have been no Russian Revolution. And we know, I mean, Fagis doesn't say this, but we know that if Lenin had been arrested, he would have been killed. And what uh, is being said here is that the greatest mistake that can be made by the ruling class is to allow the revolutionaries to make a revolution. The way to stop a revolution is to behead its leadership. And that indicates something very real. Um, I was, you know, because the ruling class makes out that the Russian Revolution was a terrible disaster, uh, a one-off, a historical accident, and all the rest, but they know, they know that it wasn't. I mean, even in, even the most, uh, even the, the bourgeoisie has got its advisors, they, they are well aware of the fact that they're sitting on a social powder keg, that their system is in crisis, and opposition to capitalism is growing, and that the October Revolution, despite whatever they want to say about it, exercises a magnetic pull uh, for anyone who um, finds themselves in opposition to the system, is appalled by its, uh, by its crimes, the grotesque uh, growth of poverty, unemployment, the waste of human life, the threat of... Uh, uh, ongoing threat of militarism and war and they want to prevent it I, I, again um, and just in closing the, in this reply I'm sure that our readers of the World Socialist website will have been very struck by the report that we gave of the uh, uh, the head of the Australian Conservatives who moved, moved a resolution in the Australian Senate insisting that there must be no celebration of the Russian Revolution. You know, he, he said, you know, it's just uh, uh, all it gave rise to was um, a litany of human rights abuses and millions of people dying uh, and liberal democracies cannot possibly sanction the celebration of the Lenin and uh, Marx, Trotsky, etc. This has all got to, this cannot be allowed to take place. Now, they didn't, you know, I believe, I think it was Nick Beams, he wrote, they didn't even bother taking a vote on it. <laughs> this was this was going to pass. And because they, they, they can't allow any discussion on the October Revolution, they just cannot allow it. Um, and I think that what we're doing, the importance of it is epitomised in that. And, you know, this is... This is an extraordinary project that we're undertaking. We are not simply um, marking the October Revolution, but dissecting the October Revolution, making it the intellectual property, the, uh, ed f f f the, the basis for the education of the working class. And I just, I just want to say one, one final thing, which... I, I, you can understand their fear. I mean, I, I've now been privileged to give introductions to three public showings, not carried out by the party, but by uh, commercial cinemas or, um, in one case, a, a, a film society of Zarta Lenin, which Julie raised in uh, her um, remarks prior to the Q&A. And I, you know something should be understood when people watch that film in every single one of these showings and these weren't these weren't people that come to a party meeting where you can assume a level of political agreement they came, they came because they were interested in finding out about the russian revolution and in every single showing there was a spontaneous and prolonged round of applause at the end of the movie uh, and that's against the background of all you know every attempt to heap filth upon the october revolution anyone that understands this process as this supreme example of the movement of millions and millions of people under the leadership of a principled uh, party guided by the most advanced revolutionary theory can understand the potential that now exists within the present situation. Thank you very much for that reply, Chris. We are actually getting quite a few questions uh, coming through now. 
There are several, both on discus and via email, which particularly relate to questions around the positions taken by Kamenev and Sinoviev and their significance both at the time and for the future course of the October Revolution. Um, perhaps I could try to um, maybe group some of these together. It might make it a little bit uh, easier for you maybe to um, answer them. So we have a question here that comes in from uh, Avery in Japan. Um, and uh, Avery asks, Karl Kautsky was prepared for revolution in 1893 but believed he could not force it or predict when it would happen. As I understand it, Trotsky had a stronger sense than Kautsky that intelligent leadership could guide the masses to a revolutionary movement when action would become impossible. Is this correct? Also, in Trotsky's opinion, what was the central task of the party before 1917 other than to postpone the desire for revolution until victory was at hand? Was that clear? And... Also, uh, there is another question uh, that concerns um, the position of um, Kamenev and Zinoviev, um, which is asked. Sorry, I'm just trying to get to it. Um, someone else asks why were Kamenev and Zinoviev not kicked out of the Bolshevik Party? for their disgraceful actions in October and right after. And then maybe you could, would you like to start with those? Um, yeah, well, they're related, but they're somewhat different. Mm. With respects to uh, the grouping, you know, the issues of Kautsky and Trotsky, I mean, Kautsky was... Uh, Considered to be the most uh, one of the most important Marxist thinkers in the uh, Second International, he was he wasn't considered to be uh, a lightweight, someone to be treated with uh, disdain. He was uh, he was someone who educated the party cadre, and the sections which I cited from Kautsky, you know, they, they were not they were not outlandish. I mean, the, this was under conditions in which. Um, you had this uh, tremendous growth of the uh, Second International under conditions of legality. There was certainly an argument against to be to be made that should be made against an adventurous policy of you know allowing the party to be involved in provocations that would uh, then be used to discredit the socialists. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the uh, Social Democrats had not always been a legal party that you know, it began. In, it worked under conditions of illegality in its early days. They, they, these were all real issues uh, for any responsible leader. But the point about um, Kautsky, not as an individual, but uh, the fate of the, so uh, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the parties of the Second International, was, whereas they, their theoretical basis was was a prof professor profession of marxism in practice over many many years they carried out essentially a reformist practice um as we as we tried to point out trade unionism development of cooperative societies publications of newspapers working uh, parliamentary work working local government that's what that's what their life was about that's what that, that's the where the where the where the entire sort of physiognomy of the party was shaped, and the point has been made in understanding um, the the reasons why, at the crucial hour, the this massive party, the, which was the leading party of the international, um, failed the supreme test of the first of the onset of the first world war. It's it's because that of that long period of uh, reformism, of uh, not challenging the state, working under conditions of legality, uh, the uh, growth of the trade unions so that they were both bigger than the party and dominated the party, a whole process of integration of 
a nominally revolutionary party within the structures of uh, uh, the German imperial order and state ended it ended with the with the um, uh, disaster of 1914 this this terrible betrayal now Trotsky uh, and it's very difficult to, get, to compare uh, Trotsky with Kautsky, but I mean Trotsky's history was one of first at fairly, firstly from his youth onwards was one of revolutionary struggle. I mean Trotsky's biography, as anyone knows, you know from you know he, he was from you know from the start, from, even as a teenager, even when before he was a Marxist, he was involved in illegal activity um, and. And when when he became a Marxist, he, he immediately dedicated himself to the uh, perspective of the overthrow of Tsarism, you know, suffering uh, imprisonment and all the rest. Moreover, Trotsky stands as you know one of the, if not the, uh, greatest proponent of revolutionary Marxism. He's you know he developed. The, the the work that Trotsky conducted in the, in uh, in the development of the theory of permanent revolution was of decisive significance in the fate of the October Revolution. He uh, the practical role he played in that revolution was extraordinary, both in, not just in the insurrection itself, but then in the forging of the Red Army. Uh, he then uh, was the one of the perhaps the principal. Uh, Speaker and theoretician of the uh, of the Communist International in, in its revolutionary period, and then, as we all know, um, was the political leader of the opposition to Stalinism, uh, its perspective of uh, building socialism in a single country, and defender of the programmatic. And political heritage of the October Revolution, and, the, and above all, the perspective of world socialist revolution, up, leading up to the formation of the Fourth International, our own party. So, it's you know, it's not, uh, it's 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 not simply that Trotsky was more far-sighted. I mean, Trotsky is a, is a world historic figure. Of whom it's difficult to uh, conceive of anyone more important from the standpoint of the revolutionary development of the international working class. Uh, what was the other question again? That was uh, about was in it. Was it uh, why weren't um, Kamenev and Zinoviev thrown out of the party for the role that they played? And also related to it, I found the question. I was also. Uh, looking for, um, uh, uh, a listener submitted the question, as I say, which relates to this, Lenin held the profound conviction that the insurrection must take place, while Zinoviev and Kamenev were deeply convinced that it had to be postponed. What factors did Zinoviev and Kamenev fail to take into consideration? Well, the most important uh, factor that they fail to take into consideration is that they that they um there was a real struggle by lenin in response to the uh, theoretical political struggle by lenin to fully understand the impact of the first world war what gave rise to the first world war what it said about the present stage of the development of world capitalism uh, and its relationship to the struggle which he'd been waging for some considerable time against opportunism within the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, and as I, as I said, the the relationship between these factors and the terrible betrayal conducted by the parties of the Second International in 1914. I mean, he understood that. Um, w Imperialism was a new stage in the development of capitalism. That um, it was the era of monopoly capitalism as opposed to free competition. The uh, the, the mer merger between industrial and finance capital, and in particular, uh, the division between the major powers of uh, the world between them, and that um, conflict 
over control of uh, over control of the planet was the uh, basis for the eruption of the 1914-18 war. He also understood that uh, that the system of imperialist exploitation of the planet as the basis for the development of opportunism, this rampant development of opportunism that ended in the, the, the betrayal of 1914, that imperialism had developed by uh, through utilizing some of the fruits of empire uh, of the cultivation of a privileged strata within uh, of within the middle class and and particularly within the aristocracy of labor who it sort of bought uh, the political loyalties of separated them off from the uh, other sections of the working class encourage them as a conservative, um, law-abiding, prosperous, etc. layer in the working class, and it was that layer to which the appeal, uh, to which the appeal of the uh, reformism, the part of the easy road, um, the acceptance of, it, of the superiority, for example, of the German civilization or British civilization or French civilization against the uh, the uh, overseas enemy that they had an interest in uh, preserving a society from which they benefited and all of that came together in uh, the uh, what took place in 1914 now on the basis of this analysis, learning, uh, Lenin turned deeper to work out exactly what what this meant for the fate of the Russian Revolution. His his basic starting point was an understanding that um, the war, uh, the corollary of the war of the uh, struggle between the imperialist powers was that this this was at the same time the era of the world socialist revolution that you know the bourgeoisie was fa the working class was faced with the task of overthrowing uh, in the imperialist system and that that was an international struggle it, it, you know one that involved the workers of, of every country you, you practically unifying against this the, the imperialist genocide that was taking place and from that basis he, he he made a, a, a reappraisal of the strategic political line pursued by the Bolsheviks up to that point, which was, um, as uh, James, I mean, if comrades want a more, more extensive answer to this, to look at the uh, James Cogan's lecture, to, you know, that instead of sort of calling for a, instead of calling for a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, um, uh, Lenin said with the uh, onset of the February Revolution that that stage had passed and it was uh, the, resp the, the task at hand was the struggle for a socialist revolution in Russia as part of a European and world socialist revolution. Now Zinoviev and Kamenev never accepted that change. Uh, they they uh, their response to the war was it was to uh, uh, to the February Revolution. Sorry, was to uh, see this as the um, realization of uh, or the partial realization of the struggle for bourgeois democracy in uh, Russia, and their perspective was to work for the consolidation of that process that they, they, they conceived of the role of the Bolshevik party as the sort of extreme left wing of that uh, revolutionary process that they had to fight for the maximum realization of um, a democratic program within Russia and so Lenin's perspective uh, the, the, mo the more it became a practical uh, reality the stiffer their opposition became, and they, it's not because um, they really looked at this as as a, as a disastrous course. I mean, they, they, you know, they looked at the the international situation. They, Lenin was exaggerating the extent of the movement of the uh, European and international working class. 
the, Russia was still isolated. Um, the Bolsheviks didn't enjoy the support that Lenin claimed. You know, the, they looked at things as as a really, you know, the most conservative estimation. What didn't What didn't they see? That we they didn't see the uh, the possibility of a socialist revolution led by the working class and led by the Bolsheviks. That was that was the least likely variant. I mean, they in their letter they say, look, if this happens, if if the, if Lenin and the party pursues this course, it will lead to disaster. We will all end up uh, isolated and then defeated. And moreover, the defeat we will suffer then will we'll then have incalculable con consequences all over the world. Now, why weren't they expelled? Everyone can read Lenin's response to you know, Zinoviev and Kamenev. He says that uh, you know they're black legs, they're scabs. This is absolutely impermissible. What they've done is completely wrong. And he he said he would rather he would rather that he wanted that they should be out of the party, and he 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 would do he would not he would go to the end of the road in the struggle against these tendencies. But Lenin is a deeply political man. This is someone who led a revolutionary party. He knew that when in dealing with Zinoviev and Kamenev, he wasn't simply dealing with individuals who betrayed, he was dealing with a political tendency that was rooted in very real political forces. I mean, Trotsky has this section again, again in the Stalin biography. He, he speaks about the party, and he says, "He says what what made what made the Bolshevik party susceptible to adapta uh, adaptation to the provisional government to uh, the February Revolution." He said, "He says the, the Bolshevik party is a workers' party, but its leadership was uh, drawn from the petty bourgeois intelligentsia, and there were people that had been in uh, persecuted." marginalized exiled working under illegality and then in february everything changed and they came out of exile uh the mensheviks from being um uh, said that even though their line was completely false they said they would never um join the bourgeois government they became government ministers they a sort of big space opened up the Bol you know the Bolsheviks could uh, were sort of encouraged to become the left wing of this development, this developing bourgeois, bourgeois order in formation, and you know th then that made them susceptible to the argument that, that to defend that bourgeois revolution, that 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 precious flower that was developing in Russia, it would be a completely false policy to uh, simply uh, call for Russia to quit the war. You know, the policy must be everyone should uh, stop the war until then, man your posts, all these things which Trotsky, Trotsky deals with in Lessons of October in other writings in which we've dealt with in, the, in this lecture series. So, you know, it's not... Lenin, you know, looked at this thing as the pressure of real material class interests as, as i said not not simply the pressure of the bourgeoisie but the pressure of the bourgeoisie refracted through the petty bourgeoisie refracted through layers in the party the party is not a homogeneous organization it contains workers the sections of the middle class all sorts of tendencies develop within the party and he fought to orient the party to the seizure of power. I mean, it should be pointed out that Kamenev was with Trotsky in the Smolny on the night of the insurrection. You know, he was sharing a room with Trotsky and when, and Tr when Trotsky fainted uh, out of exhaustion, it was Kamenev that brought him round and gave him a cup of tea. You know, because it, it, was, it wasn't the... They, they believed they would betray in the cause. They were. They, they believed that, that their line was the realistic line that would prevent a disaster. So Lenin, you know, once the crisis had passed, 
said, you know, what what would be the purpose of driving these of driving these forces out, of, of encouraging divisions in the party, when everything required that the party, having taken power, did everything it possibly could to preserve it. I mean, it wasn't so simply that they were, um, you know, why didn't they, they? They were then in the midst of a civil war. They were fighting against the white armies, the imperialist armies. So, le, le, you know, Lenin didn't personalize these things. You know, I'm not saying <laughs> not saying he didn't make personal comment because he did because he's, you know, this is a, this a, these are heated arguments, but he took a principled approach and he wasn't he, he what he did the, his approach to these questions was understanding what the inner party struggle was all about and what the party itself was all about is the instrument for making both making the revolution preserving the re revolution and extending the revolution onto the european and world arena so that that's why he didn't just uh, kick them out Thanks, Chris. Um, your lecture certainly has uh, provoked a lot of interest and uh, discussion as seen from the questions that are coming in. I appreciate that um, the, the time frame that we're working within and I'm certain that in some instances the questions are so um, broad in scope that it might be difficult to provide a definitive answer uh, to them. Perhaps... Um, but, uh, so what I'm going to try and do again is to try and uh, group them into two questions, uh, really. Um, there are a number of questions which really concern the relationship between the conflict that took place within the Bolshevik leadership on the eve of the insurrection and the future course of development of the Soviet Union, the relationship, uh, and if indeed there is a relationship between the two. Uh, one question puts it quite bluntly, um, what led to the bureaucratisation of the Communist Party after Lenin? Uh, someone else asks via Facebook, can you tell us more about the vacillating role of Stalin in October? And perhaps to bring them together, there's a quite an extended question that's also been submitted, as I said, along the same themes, um, which um, points out that while Lenin and Trotsky um, played the leading role in the October Revolution, how it was possible for uh, Stalin to seize power after Lenin, and did the crisis of the party on the eve of the seizure of power allow the party to select Stalin as a leader of the USSR? After all, just six years after 1917, Stalin was able to declare the reactionary theory of socialism in one country. Uh, I'm shortening the question down somewhat. But, um, perhaps you could uh, give some indication on on these issues. Well, that's uh, if you take them in their entirety, that's an entirely new lecture. That's the uh, development of S Stalinism within the uh, Soviet Union and the Bolshevik Party. Um, I'll try and indicate certain things. I mean, there are very definite constraints on what can be said in response to these issues. Of, yes, there is a relationship between the struggles that developed uh, in 1917 and the subsequent development of Stalinism. Uh, the personnel, the person it is involved would suggest that, even if nothing else did. Um, there was a definitely Stalin, Stalin, Zinoviev and Kamenev had uh, not simply as individuals but as representatives of uh, definite political positions occupied the most uh, conservative uh, right-wing positions within the party. He asked about what, what, what did Stalin do that showed his uh, vacillating position I can't. I, I don't want to quote chapter and verse because it, we, the time is against us. But certainly, when the uh, Pravda was uh, running articles uh, which were quite conciliatory towards the defensive position and towards the um, Constituent Assembly prior to the uh, arrival of Lenin and the 
issuing of the April thesis. It was Stalin that was editing them and putting editing the newspaper and putting it out. Uh, he didn't write them all, but that was the line. That was the line he was pursuing. Uh, and he obviously retreated. He, he, was, he was not someone who, you know, stuck to his guns in the face of opposition. You know, he, he adapted his position, but again and again throughout the re revolution, even when he uh, um, opposed, you know, lent, lent political support to Zinoviev and Kamenev at the time of the struggle that erupted uh, in October. I mean, he said at one point that if uh, that he threatened to re resign from the editorial board of, uh, I think it was still then Rabashi Put, as opposed to Pravda, uh, if they were, um, if action was taken against them. So he he had, you know, he he always was susceptible to the arguments, the the most conservative arguments, um, but he didn't put his. Uh, nail his colours to the mast in the same way that Zinoviev and Kamenev had done. But then, what took place, again, it's not, it's not an issue of original sin or identifying the villains. Uh, the subsequent degeneration of um, Stalinist degeneration of the Bolshevik party was, was not uh, can only be understood not from just drawing a line of continuity between what took place in 1917 and uh, what then developed between 1923 and 1924 and the elaboration of the theory of social in one country. I mean, in the first instance, Stalin was not the leader of the Bolshevik Party. The acknowledged leader of the Bolshevik Party until his death was Lenin. I mean, Stalin was the general secretary, but that was conceived of as a as a as an organisational. Post it. I mean, the political leadership of the Bolshevik Party was Lenin, and certainly its most prominent representative, uh, apart from Lenin, uh, from in that initial period was Trotsky, not Stalin. But the emerg the emergence of uh, Stalinism was the product of the isolation of the October Revolution in which the policies pursued and which Trotsky deals with in Lessons of October, the false policies that were pursued by the Comintern under Zinoviev, Kamenev and Stalin played a significant part in creating and perpetuating. I mean, there was a, there's a relationship. What happened is that the, you know, the as Trotsky points out in the theory of permanent revolution, the only way forward for Russia on, a, on, a, on the path of socialism was through the extension of the revolution onto the European and world arena. That was the perspective which animated, that was what the theory of permanent revolution based itself on. That's the perspective which animated Lenin. That's why they created the Communist International. The whole perspective was not for the isolated development of a Russian socialism, it was an understanding that, the, that there was no way out in the long run for Russia, for the, Ru the Soviet working class, other than through the extension of the revolution. So the failure to extend the revolution, the isolation of Russia within uh, a, a, a backward country, still a backward country, um, created enormous um, negative pressures on uh, the party, uh, it you know, it was it contributed to the uh, development of social differentiation. Uh, you know, I believe one of the earliest questions it tells me read out tonight, but I think the first question that was put on the site in before the lecture was given was on uh, the new economic policy, and, and that was a policy that was forced upon Lenin because of the isolation of the Russian Revolution and the necessity to kick-start the, de the development of industry to, to prevent uh, a breach between the agrarian areas and the cities, so they allowed a limited uh, development of capitalism. But all of these things then contributed to the, to the development of 
of, of a bureaucracy within the party, the cultivation of this bureaucracy, a recognition that uh, within it that it had independent interests, independent of the working class, that was conservative, that began to look, look on the prospect of revolution as a, as a very um, troublesome, dim prospect and all of these sentiments and social interests codified themselves into the perspective of building socialism in a single country. So tr Stalin didn't, Stalin wasn't Stalin uh, in, in 1917 in the same way that Stalin was Stalin in, 90, in the 1930s at the time of the Moscow trials. There, there was a, a whole process of political degeneration in which there's this interplay between personal weaknesses, per personal political biographies and the m movement of huge social forces which shaped history. In the case of Stalinism in the negative, from the standpoint of, as I said, of the isolation of, the, of that revolution, the, the, the failure to extend it into Europe, the, the interplay of false policies which maintain that isolation, not just in 1923, but in, in the course of the 1926 general strike, the 1927 Chinese revolution, the policy pursued in Germany against Hitler, etc., etc., etc. So it's a very complex process. And as I say, it's the subject of an entirely new lecture. Uh, and I hope that at some point we can do such a thing. I'm going to ask you a final question, uh, Chris. And again, I'm, I'm grouping uh, several together. Uh, and this is the, um, the uh, relationship between the issues that you've raised uh, from October 1917 and today. Uh, one question on Discus asks, taking all the lessons learned from the Russian Revolution, what is new in today's situation that becomes a qualitative factor? And they make a particular point in reference to the age of nuclear weapons. And then another uh, reader... Uh, asks, or listener, sorry, uh, Raymond asks in quite an extended comment in which, again, he praises the lecture series and what he describes as this incredibly informative lecture series. Um, he points out that the objective international conditions uh, that existed in uh, 1917, the mutinies amongst soldiers across Europe, was hugely significant for the movement then. And then poses the question, for us today, at a time when there is a vast potential for cross-border workers' unity and a common movement against capital in the name of establishing international socialism, it seems the situation is nonetheless even more perilous for the working class than in 1917. How do you see today's struggle relative to the weeks and months before October 1917? <laughs> right. <laughs> this will be as... Um unfortunately formulaic in far in a way that i wouldn't like to do but we have five minutes to answer this question trotsky speaks about the fact that he, even when he was writing in 1923 that the bourgeoisie we, it, at that time was more aware of the danger posed by revolution was imbued with a consciousness of the threat to its position and would do everything in its power to prevent a revolution. That was what he's saying in 1923. He said his response was that, conversely, it placed an even greater premium on the role of the Revolutionary Party in preparing and carrying out the insurrection. So he didn't sort of look at it and say it was impossible. He said, we have, as I said before, we have to rise with the occasion. Today, on so many fronts, we, you can see the situation and say, look at, what, look at the bourgeoisie, look at the weapons it's got, the surveillance techniques, the, weapon, uh, the nuclear weapons and all these things, all arrayed against the working class. And that, surely, that makes our task so much more difficult. And no one in the, in the party would argue that the revolution is not an easy thing to make. However... Consider what Trotsky said about Zinoviev and Kamenev, who looked at all of the power of the counter-revolution and concluded that revolution would be a disastrous course to take, doomed to failure. And yet, 
How do we view the situation today? We know what the bourgeoisie is capable of, but we also know what the working class is capable of and what the party is capable of. The working class today is a far more powerful force than anything which existed in 1917. There is not a country in the world today that doesn't have a powerful proletariat. Moreover, it's a proletariat that's more educated and informed on, in many areas, although I would say not politically, than at any time in history. Levels of literacy, uh, numer numeracy, uh, the ability to communicate, knowledge of computer technology, all of these factors which make the working class what it is. It plays this powerful role in the world that finds no political expression. What does the party do? The party bases itself upon that revolutionary potential that exists in the international working class. We seek to give it political guidance, organisational form. The World Socialist website is an indication of what we have working on our side. The ruling class knows that because they're trying to bar it. But we, are, we have developed the World Socialist website because the conditions exist for the development of the World Socialist website and a global communication te a de device which enables us to, f to, to fight in a way never before possible for the unification of the world working class on a revolutionary perspective, the pro propagation of Marxism. We, we, base our, we are very confident, we're not, we're not uh, stupid about this. We know that this is a big struggle and we, 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 we tell anybody that involved, gets involved in revolutionary policy must understand that this is, a, this is a major struggle, a major undertaking. But there is every possibility of a successful struggle for socialist revolution provided that the necessary leadership uh, and perspective is fought for by the International Committee of the Fourth International. Thank you, Chris, uh, for your excellent presentation and the answer to the um, very detailed questions that were asked on your lecture. And I'd like to thank all our online listeners for participating. Uh, in conclusion, I would appeal to you all again to donate generously to the World Socialist website and make the decision to join and build the socialist equality parties in your countries as sections of the International Committee. I again invite you to participate in the concluding lecture in this series by David North, Chairperson of the International Editorial Board of the WSWS, under the title The Place of the October Revolution in World History and Contemporary Politics. Again, please note the change in schedule for this lecture, which will take place on November the 11th at the same time. And so it just remains for me to say thank you and good morning Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are, until the next lecture. Thank you very much.